And uh, John Dominic Crossan is joining us today from his home near Orlando, Florida. And uh, John Dominic Crossan, welcome. Thanks for being with us. It's a pleasure to be back with you, Doug, once more. I want to uh, b- begin by asking you, you, you say because of the importance of Christmas and because it's so widely observed in the, in the world, certainly the Western world, that we, it's important that we understand the stories of the birth of Jesus, that this matters. Why do you think this matters? It matters because I think the message is of, of importance way beyond Christianity, and certainly that message could come to us in other religions. I have no reason to think there's a monopoly on it in Christianity, but if we're going to mention Christmas, and we're going to talk about Christmas, we should at least know what we're talking about, and if we're denying it or affirming it, (laughs) know what we're doing, what we're talking about. Let's talk about first the way uh, most Christians uh, hear the story or understand the story, and there's there's a clue there. It's not just story. As I said before, um, most don't understand there are actually two stories here, and I guess it's important to say they're significantly different in many ways. And it's really the difference that tells us and lets us see what Matthew and Luke are trying to do. And it's, it's only a basic courtesy when somebody speaks to you or writes to you that the first thing you do is try to understand, okay, what do you want to tell me? Then I can decide whether I agree with you, of course, or disagree with you. I have to listen first. Mm. And that means in this case, we have actually to read the story. It's a, it's a sort of a radical suggestion. When all <laughs> else fails, read the text. <laughs> so go back and read the story, Matthew and Luke. And what strikes you is how different it is. And the point that arises from that is not sort of a gleeful look at mistakes or discrepancies. It is a warning that each of these writers had very different purposes. Mm. They were each going to write a sort of an overture to their own quite distinctive Gospels that followed. The stories of of Christmas are personal, you say, but we also have to understand them as being political. Talk about that. In one sense, we've almost sentimentalized it by taking half the story. It is the story about the birth of a child, and surely in all the world that is a happy event. Mm -hmm. So why should the birth of this child, for example, make the local king, who happens to be Herod the Great at the time, decide that he had a royal obligation to kill him. What's what's threatening about the birth of a little child? What's threatening about a baby? So rather than sentimentalize it, we have to ask that question. Why did the birth of Jesus within this time and place threaten anyone? You... Let me ask you what you were getting at with the book, because you say early on in it, you and and, uh, Marcus Borg, that you're not concerned with the factuality of the birth stories you're thinking about it d- differently. Yeah, what we wanted to say was it is our considered judgment that both Matthew and Luke set out to write a parable. And we mean that in the very strict sense in which most Christians, and indeed most people, have heard of the parables of Jesus, and they may have heard at least of the story of the Good Samaritan. And most Christians are aware that it's no problem that that is a fiction, that Jesus made up that story. But at the end of that made-up story... Jesus says, go and do likewise. So even though we're listening to a made-up story, a creation, a parable in plain language, Mm. it is a lure for decision and action. So a parable can tell you to do something. So we're using that term and saying, as Jesus made up stories about God, the evangelists, let us say, picked up that habit from Jesus Mm. and made up stories about him, Jesus. So you're making this distinction that you're not trying to debunk a story. You say people who look at, for example, the contradictions between Matthew and Luke are, are debunkers. You're not doing that. You're looking at the, the differences as a way of seeing them as, as you say, separate narratives. Yes, Doug. And, I mean, if you thought of supposing somebody, uh, let's imagine the first audience hearing Jesus' story of the Good Samaritan. And supposing they broke into immediate debate about I don't, did that really happen? Is is this a piece of gossip? Uh, Did it happen yesterday and Jesus is passing on a story we all should know about? Is this the news, as it were, program? Most people would say, get a life, it's a parable. Jesus just made it up. But the point is that if you stayed on that factuality point, did it really happen? Did the good Samaritan go down that road and help the, the Jew who was beaten and left to die in the ditch? 
if you got into that argument, you would have very wisely, prudently avoided the challenge of the parable, which is, if you find your enemy in the ditch, what are you going to do about it? Mm. Go and do likewise. Mm. So in one sense, we are saying, from our point of view, the accounts in Matthew and Luke are not and were not intended to be history in their details. Of course, Jesus was born. Of course, Mary and Joseph existed. So did Bethlehem. So did Nazareth. So did Herod. But the story were intended to be parables. And to debate the facticity and historicity of them is a way of avoiding their challenge. You say that inside of these stories, you will find the entire Christian gospel in, in miniature. Um, get it, you write, and you get everything. Miss it, and you, and you miss it all. If you've ever seen an ancient manuscript, say, of the gospel, the first thing it does is make your head spin. It's, you know, it doesn't have all the divisions of chapters of verses that we have. It doesn't have paragraphs. It doesn't even have periods. It's all written in uppercase capitals, and there's not even the divisions between the words. So you'd be really happy for somebody who writes a sort of an overture, a prologue up front in the first two chapters, and is giving you sort of, like, here's an outline of what I'm going to be saying in the next, what we call, say, 24 chapters for Luke, 28 for Matthew. It's like a help to the reader. So pay attention to the first two chapters. As we tell you about the birth of this child, we're really going to outline the destiny of this child. So read carefully the prologue or the overture is their message. Mm. What do you think it means, um, Professor Crossan, that throughout t- over time, people have sort of conflated the two stories, harmonized the two stories? Um, is there anything wrong with that? Is that sort of a natural inclination? Well, there's nothing wrong with harmonizing the stories as long as you don't gut the message in the process. Yeah, yeah. If we had three or four versions, say, of the Good Samaritan, we only have one in Luke. If we had four versions and we sort of put them all together, that would be fine as long as the main thing is that the Samaritan stops to help the person left for dead. That's mm. the core of the message. So it's not really that we want to launch an attack on do not unite these stories. If you want to put the shepherds into the, the crib alongside the wise men, mm. that's fine. Just don't call the wise men kings, because the kings in this story are bad. They're on the other side. Herod is the king. So when you have the wise men, if you want to count them as, as three, go right ahead. It's not in the New Testament, but that's not fighting over. Right. If, if you want to um, put names on them, that's fine. That's not worth arguing about. They are the wisdom of the East confronting the power of the West, and that is important (laughs) then and now. So when you unite them, if you do, know what you're doing and make certain you don't leave out the heart of the matter. Mm. Do you think that uh, Christians do the same thing with with the Bible in the sense that they see it as this kind of one monolithic narrative as opposed to a collection of very different stories told in different times with different historical contexts behind them. They do very often. So it's a process that goes on and goes on, say, with the four stories of the, the execution of Jesus. And, and here's what is important. When Christians first put titles on what we call the four Gospels or the New Testament Gospels, they never call them the Gospels. They call them the Gospel singular according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They, as far as they were concerned, there was only one gospel, namely the good news that not Caesar, but Christ mm. was Lord of the universe. That was their good news. And they knew there were different versions of that. There was the version according to Matthew, according to Luke. According to, so they understood that. We tend to conflate the whole thing together, then get into hundreds of years of arguments. But Matthew says this and Luke says that. And how do we reconcile them? And the people who put the four versions in there were just as intelligent as we are and could see all of that and knew that that was not the point. The point was one gospel in multiple versions. Mm. When did the the nativity stories, um, when did they start, when did they emerge, I guess, in Christianity? When did they start to become important? Well, I think they were there very, very early, but... Mark, for, for example, which is the first gospel. Well, let's go back even before Mark. Luke is, excuse me, Paul is writing his epistles in 
the 50s, let's say, yeah. the, the middle of the first century, the most thing he has to say about Jesus is that he was born of a woman, and generally speaking, most of us would have guessed that even without Paul telling us. <laughs> so it's the usual way to enter the world. Right. But there's not a, not a hint in Paul of any of the other things. I, Paul would have loved to be able to say, and I am speaking to the Gentiles because Gentiles came and worshipped Christ when he was a baby. I don't think you can say, well, Paul just didn't use those stories. He simply doesn't know them. They were not created yet. They weren't there when Mark wrote his account of the gospel in, say, the 70s, early 70s. It's in the 80s and the 90s that Matthew and Luke, and only Matthew and Luke, Mm. and nobody else in early Christianity that's not dependent on them, decided to tell us their unique way of, here's how Jesus was born for Luke, here's how Jesus was born for Matthew. So at what point did they become... It seems in some ways, maybe maybe this is n- not entirely the case, but the way Christians look on the death of Jesus Christ and the, the, the resurrection and that story, it seems in some ways the, the story of the birth is, is as important to Christians. At what point did it, did it become so critical in the, in the, in the larger story? Well, it started, it started very immediately, I think, even by the end of the second century, when you're starting to get... Uh, images of Christ, Mary holding the, the child, and even the, the wise men coming to him is, a, is an image. I think it may be really with, with Francis, say, in the 13th century, that when Christ had almost threatened to disappear into the clouds as, a, as sort of a transcendental divinity and the humanity had got lost, that one way to insist on the humanity, to insist on it, is to imagine him as a baby to imagine him being born, to imagine his mother. So I think it's, it's one of the great ways throughout Christianity, then and now, of insisting on the humanity, and for Christians that should not be over against the divinity, but on both together as like two sides of the one coin. Mm. John Dominic Crossan, because mentioning the distinctions are, um, I think it would be important. It's surprising, I guess, maybe first of all, how little of Matthew's birth story is about Jesus, for example. Jesus, you write in, in the Nativity story, is almost off the stage. Yes, in Matthew. We'll focus on Matthew just for a moment. Yeah. Matthew tells the whole thing through the viewpoint of Joseph. It's, it's rather patriarchal. Joseph is the, it's not supposed to be the father, actually, according to Matthew, but it's all told through him. Mm. The Annunciation is made, actually, not to Mary, but to Joseph in a dream at night in Matthew. And you might note how few images, paintings, sculptures have ever been made of that Annunciation scene. We usually always get it from Luke where the angel Gabriel appears to Mary. But in in Matthew, it's all told from the point of view of Joseph. And as you mentioned at the beginning, as far as Matthew is concerned, the family is living at Bethlehem and only moves from Bethlehem to Nazareth at the end of the story. Then everything is told through Joseph's point of view. The major theme, I suppose, that's in Matthew, and it's a dark theme, by the way, is that as soon as the Magi, wise men, the wisdom of the East, as I said, come to Herod and tell him that they're looking for the king of the Jews, which, of course, is Herod's own title, and he has rather a monopoly on it, shall we say, Mm. he immediately interprets that to mean the Messiah, that is the the just king whom Israel had hoped would come to liberate them and to rule the world in peace and justice and nonviolence. Immediately, Herod then sets out, as we know, to kill this newborn child by killing all the male children under two years in Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. And then the flight into Egypt takes place, so that as far as Matthew is concerned, as long as the Jewish homeland is under Herod the Great in collaboration with Rome, it has become the new Egypt, and Herod is the new Pharaoh who had tried to kill all the young Jewish males in order to kill Moses. So Jesus, in a huge irony for Matthew, is fleeing into Egypt, Mm. not out of Egypt as Moses had. The Jewish homeland under Herod is the new Egypt. 
And Luke's story, then, um, as you say, among the differences, the Annunciation, Gabriel comes to Mary. And in fact, this is the most distinguishing feature about the, about, I guess, the writing of, of Luke, um, both in the, in the Acts, uh, which he's, I, I guess, believed to have written, and, and uh, Luke, uh, that women play such a prominent role in these stories. Exactly. Well, you'd think it would be obvious, wouldn't you? If, if we're talking about a birth story, you might want to mention the mother. <laughs> right. But you'd almost get the idea that you could tell the story without the mother in Matthew. Luke insists not only is Mary the first thing she does after the angel announces it, she doesn't even bother go out and tell Joseph. Joseph, there's, and there's good news and there's bad news. Mm-hmm. She goes immediately to, in this story, to her cousin Elizabeth. And the women rejoice together. And it's It's told very much from a female point of view, and that, of course, is in keeping with the emphasis on women throughout Luke's gospel. And it's one of the ways you recognize immediately that the purpose of a nativity story for Matthew and for Luke is to be a sort of an overture, microcosm, miniature summary of the gospel to follow. So the themes that come up in Matthew 1 and 2 and Luke 1 and 2 will be repeated, you know, like themes as it were, throughout an opera or something that you've heard in the overture. Throughout those two Gospels, and you just mentioned one of them, a major one for Luke, the emphasis on the women and on Mary. What, what do you make of the, the idea? I've heard it, uh, I don't think it's very widely held, but there's been some belief that perhaps or some question about whether or not the person who wrote Luke was in fact a, a woman. Is there anything to that? It, it would be very hard to tell, but the, I would not think so, because one of the distinctive things in Luke, and it's a little ambiguous, is that he, is, he talks an awful lot about women, but it's not very clear to me that Luke wants them in charge. They're, they're major sponsors <laughs> of Christian communities for Luke, but some of my feminist colleagues have noted that... Uh, Enthusiastic sponsors are not exactly the same as major leaders, so I'm not sure that Luke is a woman. <laughs> Why do you figure that um, the story in Luke um, is sort of the one told the most? Is it just because it's a, be- a better story? I mean, you know, you've got shepherds, you've got um, – it's just a better, better tale maybe. Well, I think yes. I mean, I, I suppose if I had to be ruthless about the whole thing and I said, would I choose Luke as a, a, as a better storyteller over Matthew, it's probably very unfair to do this. Mm. But yeah, I mean, if you look actually at the images throughout Christian art that have been drawn on the nativity, just go through them. As I said, you'll find hundreds of the Annunciation from Gabriel to Mary. I'm sure you'd find hundreds. I, I would doubt if you'll find more than a couple, if you even find a couple of the Annunciation to Joseph. Luke, Luke sets the scene much better. For example, the crib scene is basically totally Luke. Let's say it's 95% Luke yeah. with the three wise men tucked at the back just to try and kind of bring it in. But that's all that comes from Matthew in the crib scene. At what point did this um, this question about the, the the these birth stories that they were f- that they were fact? When did they first emerge in Christianity? Because you say that it's fairly recent, the last few hundred years. It really is. I think it's a post Enlightenment phenomenon it, in a pre Enlightenment world. And it would be very foolish to think that pre Enlightenment people were all fools. They just believed anything they were told. Sure. Pre-Enlightenment people did take it for granted that wonderful things could happen. There was too much in the world that could not be explained. Mm-hmm. Just trying to explain, say, the order of the heavens. I mean, if they, 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 they could see the planets moving moving with, with the same rhythms and everything else, so common sense would say there must be somebody up there driving yeah. <laughs> on a kind of a superhighway in the sky. So many of their explanations we would not accept today, but that doesn't mean they were fools. So they would accept that marvels happen. Mm. And the only real pre-enlightenment question was, okay, you're telling me this marvelous story, and I have no reason to doubt your marvelous story since I know lots of other marvelous stories. Why should I care about your marvelous story? You're telling me about a wonderful child 
born of a divine and human uh, relationship. Okay, fine. First century person might say pre-enlightenment. I've heard those stories before. I've even heard them about the Roman Emperor Augustus. Mm. His mother, Atia, and the god Apollo conceived him. Okay, tell me why I should care. <laughs> Not why I should disbelieve, but why should I care? What's this child brought to the world that's, that's worthy of such a divine conception? Those are all good pre-enlightenment questions, and they are really the real questions. What claim has been made when you say, in the ancient world, this child was born of a divine and human conjunction? What mm. claim are you making about, not the mother and her biology, but about the child and his destiny? You know, it brings us to this question that you, you and Marcus Borg raise in the, in the book about uh, this idea of f fact fundamentalism, that if it's not factual, it's not true. Um, but you, you, see it, you see it very differently. Yeah, it's terribly important. And it, you know, it, when I think the New Testament authors are presenting me with a fact, such as that Jesus did exist, that Jesus was born, that Mary and Joseph were his parents, that he was crucified, for example, when they are telling me a fact, I take those facts very seriously. Mm. But I also know, and if you believe, for example, the New Testament is inspired, I see no reason why God can't inspire parables. Mm. It seems to have been Jesus' predominant mode of teaching. And I think all the New Testament writers picked that up from Jesus. So I have no problem at all with saying that when you're confronted with a parable, you don't ask about the facts. When you're confronted with the prodigal son, you shouldn't ask, hey, was there really a father with those two sons? I think the answer would be, it's a parable, dummy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and the, asking the fact questions when you're confronted with a parable is the best way, the smartest way to avoid the issue. <laughs> Do you believe in it? Are you going to accept the message of the parable? So I think pre-enlightenment people were quite capable of hearing a story and bracketing the immediate, say, wait a minute, did that actually happen? Mm. But getting the message, and then, of course, they would either agree or disagree with the message, with the point. Which, of course, brings us to kind of the landscape of, uh, of American Christianity today, which, as you explain in the book, you know, at least a half of uh, American Christians have a kind of literal, factual understanding, for example, of the Genesis stories of creation and of the Bible as a whole. And you, you say in the book that this kind of sets up... Uh, a test, you know, that if, if whether Jesus was in fact born of a virgin now becomes a test of faith. And I guess in some ways American Christians who believe very literally in it are sort of painting themselves into a corner, are they not? Well, I think they really are, Doug, and in one sense they are both. Both sides of this debate are trapped in the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. If you want to sort of oversimplify the Enlightenment and imagine it as saying, well, the only truth is is factual truth and whether you can prove it as in science, as you usually can. If, if you have a theory in science, you can go out usually and test it and see if it works for you, as it works for me, and if it doesn't work for you and does work for me, there's a problem. Mm. That became almost the norm of truth, not just of scientific truth, but of any truth. And it kind of wiped out poetry and it wiped out metaphor and it wiped out mm. parable for any people. The real truth had to be factual. Now, neither of us are saying that factual truth is not important. If I ask you for directions how to get to your house, I really want you to give me factual <laughs> truth. If I'm reading a recipe, I want factual truth. I want to know how much flour to put in. Don't tell me a pinch. Tell me a, you know, an ounce or something. Yeah. So there is a place, of course, for factual truth. Of course. But there is also a part. And religion is especially redolent with metaphorical poetic, parabolic truth. And to have lost that is to have conceded the Enlightenment to the wrong side, so that in one sense, those who are trapped and saying, this is just a tissue of, of contradictions. Read this birth story of Luke and the birth story of Matthew. They can't agree on anything. Ha, ha, ha. That's one side. The other side, no, no, you can take them very carefully and put them together, and you get a single homogeneous account of what happened. They are both wrong. <laughs> they are really locked 
on the two fateful sides and they're drowning together, mm. <laughs> clasped in each other's arms. If I could say it again, it's a parable. It's a parable. It's a parable. Let's uh, take a few calls. Rob is with us, and he's calling from Ogden, Utah. Rob, hi. Hi, how's it going? Great. Just had a question. I About a year ago, I kind of began my own self-enlightenment or period of enlightenment here where uh, I, I'm an ex-Mormon, the history of the Bible and the church. I've, I've really come to see how a lot of that stuff is terrible. It's made a huge difference in my life, and I'm much happier with it now. And I'm wondering... Um, if the the guest thinks that that's going to continue or if it will be a while before people begin to take these things as parable, put them in a not such a, a truth historical sense in their lives, but something that, that uh, just more gives the, the guidance rather than anything literal fact. Hmm. I hope so, Rob. I hope I, what Marcus and I are trying to do in this book, and we were hoping to do it the last week, the prece- preceding book, and others we're going to write together is really to empower the center of Christianity, to, to get out of that deadly strife that if it isn't factual, it is rubbish. We're trying to, to insist on the power of parable, and we, we think we are in, completely in keeping with the best of the Christian tradition in doing that. So yes, I hope there's going to be more and more understanding of when we are talking about facts and when most of the time in the Bible we're talking about parable. Mm. Rob, glad you called. Thanks very much. Shane is with us, calling from Salt Lake. Shane, hi. Good morning. Morning. Uh, one thing I've always wondered about is, uh, for such a big moment in history, I've never heard of any other texts, um, whether factual or, or parable, like you say, which I've never actually thought of it as. I'm wondering if there are any other texts from that era, of thousands of years ago, about Jesus' birth that didn't appear in the New Testament. No, Shane. No, when, when Jesus was born, and wherever Jesus was born, nobody was watching. And let me give you an example. Um, I can't even remember the date now. It may have been before or after 1900. Um, Gandhi was taken off the train at Peter Maritzburg. Nobody was watching. I doubt if it even made the papers. Mm-hmm. But years later, Gandhi would say, that's when it all began for me. In many historic periods, moments, people's lives, the first moment where it started, nobody was watching. So no, the angels had to come down that night from heaven to draw attention to it. Nobody was watching, except maybe the animals. Hmm. Shane, glad you called. Scott is with us in Salt Lake. Scott, welcome. Yes, hello. One of the things that I enjoy about the New Testament is how many different English translations there are, because I feel like they, for those of us who don't know the original Koine Greek, how much uh, perspective they can give us on different ways of looking at the Greek. But one of the the questions I have is that uh, some translations have astrologers in Matthew chapter 2, others have the term wise men, and others have the term magi. And I guess what my question to you is, is are they in fact the same? Are they just synonyms for the same thing? Or are each of the translators getting kind of a different take on uh, what those people were that came from the East? Mm. They're all probably valid. The term is the Magi, and those are Persian wise men, and the Persian wise men were skilled and known in the reading of the skies, uh, somewhere between astrology and astronomy. So astronomers would be good, ancient astronomers. Magi would be good, wise men. I don't know if it would be politically correct at the moment to say, of course, they were then Iranians. So we have three Iranians in our crib this Christmas. Wow. Well, let me ask you, uh, Professor Crossan, you know, that story of the of the Magi, it's so particular. Um, they came, they, they brought gifts, and not only gifts in a generic sense, they brought gold and frankincense and myrrh. What is Matthew getting at with being so specific if he's trying to be, if he's trying to speak in metaphors? Does that just empower the, um, the, the, the symbology, I guess, of the story? Yes. Uh, the, the other major story to which this is a counter story was that under Caesar Augustus and his adopted father, Julius Caesar, the story of their gen- gen- genealogical origin was that a thousand years before, at the time of the Trojan War, Aeneas, the Aeneid is his story, of course, mm-hmm. Aeneas, who is the son of Venus, the goddess Venus, and the Trojan hero Anchises, was led westward 
guided by Venus's westward star. The story? Yes. The, the other major story to which this is a counter story was that under Caesar Augustus and his adopted father, Julius Caesar, the story of their gen, gen, genealogical origin was that a thousand years before, at the time of the Trojan War, Aeneas, the Aeneid is his story, of course, mm-hmm. Aeneas, who is the son of Venus, the goddess Venus, and the Trojan hero Anchises, was led westward, guided by Venus's westward star. So they left Troy in time to be saved before the city was ruined and set up the genealogical forebears of Caesar Augustus in Italy. So a guiding star taking people westward was terribly well known as the genealogical basis for antiquity, for the thousand-year-old genealogical claims of Caesar, let's say. So now, what's important here is, again, we have a guiding star, not just you know an explosion in the heavens of, of a new planet or something. We have a star that can take these people westward. And then, of course, since we have to get Herod into the story, the star kind of stops apparently at Jerusalem. So unlike most men on, when they're traveling, they have to stop and ask for directions, and we know that's not something that men usually do. So <laughs> they stop and ask directions, and then the star picks up again and takes them down to Bethlehem. This is a guiding star. In mm. plain language, it's a magic star. It has nothing to do with any conjunction of the heavens, but it's a counter star to the guiding star that set up Caesar Augustus as the Roman emperor in Italy. And do you think people in first century, in the first century of the Common Era would, would have understood that? When they have read that as a symbol, they would have thought, they would have known, oh, this is what he's getting at. Well, one of the things we have found, I, most people in the first century would not have been reading Aeneas and the Aeneid, so they right. wouldn't have read it there. But we have images of Aeneas taking his aged father and Jesus on his left shoulder and holding their little son, Julius, for whom the Julian line would allegedly descend, are all over the place, from Tunisia, it's in Turkey, they're in Italy, on lamps, on tombstones. So it would be as obvious to us if you saw a picture of, say, a woman on a donkey with a child on her lap and a man walking along beside him, you'd say, oh, flight into Egypt. Yes, people would have known all over the Roman world of the claims, at least, of the westward guiding Venus star that had brought the forebears of Caesar Augustus to Italy and his destiny. So yes, I think most people would have got the story of the guiding star that's bringing somebody else westward, not to Caesar, but to Christ. And they would have made the connection, I guess, um, in the, 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 the connection that Matthew was trying to make, seeing Jesus as the new lawgiver, as as the new Moses, um, because that's a prominent theme in this, in this overture, in this story. He's trying to make it clear that um, Jesus is here to not replace the old, but to um, sort of fu- fulfill uh, the, the idea. And they would have understood those ideas. I would put it this way. They could not have. Yeah. It would be so obvious to them that an evil ruler trying to kill a predestined child by killing all the young male children would send fireworks off in their imagination. Pharaoh, Pharaoh, birth of Moses in Exodus. Herod is the new Pharaoh. Yes, and of course, that's the very reason why in their story, the guiding star has to sort of halt at Jerusalem, because if they don't ask for directions from Herod, then Herod doesn't get into the story. And If you're really making up the story and don't want Herod in it, there's no difficulty in having them come in from Jericho, come straight to Bethlehem, go out, never go near Jerusalem. Mm. So you can understand that Matthew, in trying to get Herod as the new pharaoh and get the Magi in there as coming from the east, has to have them stop in, in Jerusalem to ask for directions. John Dominic Crossan is with us. His book, uh, written along with the scholar Marcus Borg, is called The First Christmas, What the Gospels Really Teach About Jesus' Birth. We're going to take another break. Back in a moment, this is Radio West on KUER and XM Public Radio.
This is Radio West. I'm Doug Fabrizio. Today in the program, we have with us the biblical scholar John Dominic Cross, and we're talking about his book, The First Christmas, What the Gospels Really Teach About Jesus' Birth. Let's go back to the phones. Aaron is joining us in Brawley, California. Aaron, welcome. Hey, thanks for taking my call. Sure. Hey, I'm on a cell phone. I'm out here in the desert, so I might have a little trouble with you here. But, okay. Uh, my question is, uh, and I'll just ask the question and hang up, but... Uh, I'm studying the book of Isaiah and about the prophecies about Jesus. And uh, in the book of Isaiah, it talks about, uh, uh, in Jesus' birth, how God's going to show something magnis- magnificent, something incredible. Uh, and if, uh, if that's the case, then, and, uh, then, then what's so uh, incred- incredible about Jesus being born just as a regular person? All right. The... What is important, and now we're getting to the heart of the matter, Aaron, and you're out in the desert, and that's a good place to be thinking about these <laughs> things, really, because everything important in the Bible starts in the desert, as you know. Get out of the city and think. So the important thing is that Caesar Augustus, who was Lord, Savior of the world, born also of a divine and human conjunction, the program that Caesar incarnated, I'm going to say, was what I summarize as peace, Global peace, that's what Rome guaranteed the world. Global peace through victory. And the good news that has been proclaimed by Matthew and Luke is that there is an alternative vision to peace through victory, because as we now know, if we know it better than they ever did, you don't get peace from victory, you just get a lull until the next round when, when the violence comes back even worse than before. That's at least a pattern of 6,000 6, years. The good news that is announced at Christmas, in both those Christmas stories, is that there is an alternative to peace through victory, and it is peace through justice. That this child inaugurates, incarnates in the Christian vision, a new way of bringing peace to the world, if we're going to cooperate with it. Of course, if we don't, then then there's really no good news at Christmas. It's just something we take out of the attic every with the ornaments, and we're going to put back at the end and do, forget about it for another year. So yes, your question is the really the right question. What's extraordinary about this child? Because it is not about the biology of Mary. It is about the identity and destiny of the child, and that is told in the ancient way by saying that this was a, an extraordinary conception. But what they're really talking about is this was an extraordinary life. And then the real question is, so what? What did this life bring to the world? Mm. Aaron, thanks very much for the call. It's important to put these stories, uh, Professor Cross, in, in, the, in the context, as you do, of um, the first century, in the context of history, um, because you say that you know, the debate about whether they're factual or fable makes no sense if you don't, um, and that kind of goes nowhere, that we have to understand it as a sort of a product of its time. And you see parables, or you describe parables, I guess, as stories that were subversive. I wanted you to talk about that. Yeah, and the, the lure of a parable is to get audience participation. Mm-hmm. You can always give people a sermon and then go away. If you tell a parable, as Jesus did, especially in an oral situation, you're going to get the audience arguing with themselves. They're going to start saying, well, no Samaritan would act like that. I know Samaritans. They're not like that. Uh, why are you always picking on the priests and the Levites? The audience will start arguing. In other words, parable is a way of maximizing audience participation. When you go back after hearing the parable of the sower, you've got one thing for certain, this ain't about sowing. Mm. (laughs) So what is it about? So parables are really a profound and maybe even the best way of religious education. For children too, by the way. Children like stories. So if you don't pound on, well, these are factual stories, and let's argue every, every centimeter of their factuality, then you can get the message of a parable. You can let it speak to you. But you really can't do it, actually, without knowing a little history. And I know some Christians might say, you mean to be a good Christian, I have to know a little history? I would say, yes, dear Christian, because the Bible tells you that history belongs to God, too. Seems to understand uh, any of these stories. You have to understand the clash between the kingdom of Rome and the kingdom of God. This is the important context in understanding the, the story of the birth of Jesus Christ. 
it really is, and, and that's the, in a way the heart of the book. As yeah. soon as, let's take one term that both Matthew and, and Luke both use, Jesus is the Messiah, that is, he's the awaited just king whom Israel had dreamed of who would bring peace on earth. That's interpreted as king of the Jews in Matthew, and since that's the title of Herod appointed, given to him by Rome, by the way, the only one who could give that title, and we next hear of it in Matthew on the cross of Jesus. So Herod tries to kill the new king of the Jews, and Pilate thinks he has succeeded in doing it. So you can't read that without saying there's a clash between the God of Jesus and the kingdom of Rome. And if you look at Luke, when Luke mentions Messiah, he immediately surrounds it by titles such as Son of God, Lord, Savior, Bringer of Peace. And that's like a huge duh in the first century. Those are all the titles of Caesar. Hmm. And you're taking them from the Roman emperor and giving them to a Jewish peasant? Is this low lampoon or is it high treason? And since the Romans didn't roll over laughing, they understood exactly what it was, high treason. What was the... um, the, the, I I want you to say a little bit about... um, the the Roman Empire feeling threatened by these by these stories, um, but but also before that, Jesus Christ emerges at a time of um, kind of a series of uprisings um, by Jews against the Roman state, and something happens um, in the, uh, the the village, I guess, of of Sepphoris, that provides. Um, an important understanding for understanding uh, Christ's birth and understanding, I guess, even the, the ministry of Christ later. Yes, Nazareth is really a, t- a tiny little satellite village to the major city, which was at the time of Jesus' birth, the capital of, of Galilee. The, after the death of Herod the Great, all over the Jewish homeland there were uprisings, not a single concerted, controlled, operated rebellion, but rebellions everywhere. It was, it was like the, the pressure cooker, the lid blew off the pressure cooker when Herod died. Jesus is born, as best we can reconstruct the date, close to the end of Herod's uh, reign, and that was around, he died in 4 BCE by our calculations as we, as we date things today. One of the risings took place at Sepphoris, and the Jewish historian Josephus mentions that a Roman legion, Two legions came south from their Syrian bases to put down the rebellions. One of them came east from Ptolemais on the coast and burned Sepphoris to the ground. Now, that is crucial because that means about the time Jesus was born, a Roman legion, and they came with fire and sword. Mm. They came and said, as it were, we're coming now, and we won't be back for one or two generations because you're going to remember this. So it's not as if the Romans were mythical beasts way off there when Jesus was growing up. I can't imagine that the major subject in tiny Nazareth as he grew up was not that terrible day when the Romans came and when every male who didn't hide and every woman who didn't hide and every child who didn't hide were respectively murdered, raped, and enslaved. That would be the major thing Jesus heard as he was growing up about the Romans and about rebellion against the Romans and about where was God Where was God when his people were being slaughtered by the Romans? Those are things that a child thinks about growing up. We really are not interested in arguing with them. We honestly, profoundly aren't. We will tell them we don't believe a word of it. We don't believe that Matthew and Luke intended it as a parable. But we would prefer to say to them, all right, you take it literally, historically. We take it metaphorically and parabolically. What are you going to do about peace on earth? That is the message, the message that comes down from the sky, as it were, whether you take it literally or metaphorically, is there is a way of getting peace on earth, and it's a new way. It's an alternative way to the normalcy of civilization, which always guarantees you peace through violence. And it's a bankrupt, it's a bankrupt way, we now know. So is there an alternative? And the good news of the Christmas story is there is another way of gaining peace, peace through justice, peace through making certain that everyone gets a fair share of God's earth, that nobody has a monopoly on it. What do you want to do about that when you take it literally? We know what we are trying to do about it when we take it parabolically. 
that is really what we would prefer to say to those who want to argue heresy or argue that it must be taken literally. It must be taken seriously. 